Father in heaven, as we draw be close to your throne again with our hearts, help us, Father, to, to, to remove the distractions around us, to focus completely on what you have to say. Help us, Father, to, to not only hear you this morning, but to listen. That these words may lead with us and change us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a man by the name of Charles Boswell. He was a great athlete and a soldier in World War II. And unfortunately, during a tragic accident, when he was rescuing a friend from a burning tank and it exploded, he was rendered permanently blind. Now, he was a great athlete before his accident, and in a testimony to his talent and a determination to continue and not let his impaired sight slow him down, he decided to try a brand new sport, a sport that he never even imagined playing before, even with eyesight. He decided he was going to learn to play golf. Now, I don't know if you, any of you have played golf before, but golf is not necessarily easy to play when you have sight. And he was going to play blind. And through determination and a deep love for the game, he actually became the national blind golf champion. And he won that, net, that honor 13 times, as well as achieving three hole-in-ones during his career. <laughs> I can't hit the hole-in-one if I'm looking at it. One of his heroes was the great golfer Ben Hogan. And it was truly an honor for Charles one day when he won the Ben Hogan Award in 1958. And then when he won that award, he was able to meet Ben Hogan. When he met him, Charlie was awestruck, and, and he stated that he had only one wish, and it was to play a round of golf with the great Ben Hogan. Well, Mr. Hogan agreed that it would, having a round together of golf would be an honor for him as well. After all that he'd heard of, of Charlie's accomplishments, and he truly admired his skills. And then, when they talked about it a little bit further, Charlie blurted out, Would you like to play for money, Mr. Hogan? Well, Ben Hogan immediately answers, I can't play for money. That wouldn't be fair. Oh, come on, Mr. Hogan, Charlie said. $1,000 per hole. What do you say? Mr. Hogan said, I can't. What would people think of me taking advantage of, of something with a situation like that? You and your circumstances, that would be wrong for me to do that. Charlie looked at him and says, are you chicken, Mr. Hogan? Okay, blurted a frustrated Hogan. I'm going to play with you, but I'm going to play my best. He says, I, I wouldn't expect anything else, said the confident Bodwell, Boswell. Okay, you're on, Mr. Boswell. Just name the time and the place we'll play. A very self-assured Boswell responded, 10 o'clock tonight. Now, if you've never played golf... It's not easy to play during the day. It's even more impossible to play at night. Right? I lose an average of 10 balls every time I play in the daylight. I can't even imagine playing at golf. It's amazing, but if you think about it, blindness, in a sense, is, uh, can be a matter of perspective. Blindness really is, we, we think of it as just without sight, but there are moments in your life that you also have no sight. You put a mixed group of sighted and non-sighted people in the middle of a large cavern at, Great, at Carlsbad Caverns and then turn off the lights and see who is the one who can see. In fact, in that situation, you'll notice the first people to panic will be who? The ones who had sight. The ones who did not have sight, they, would, they wouldn't even notice. It actually reminds me of a, 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 an experience I had at summer camp. I, one of the weeks during the summer was blind camp and we had a lot of kids go there and I was a counselor for the cabins that week. And I remember I, I tried to use a threat that I had used at every other week. And as it became close to nighttime and they kept talking, they were talking loud, I threatened to turn off the lights if they didn't quiet down. And they all laughed at me. They said, we didn't even know they were on. You see, we can be blinded by many things. Sometimes we can be blinded by ambition. We can be blinded by love. And many, many of us have experienced what it means to have a car pull into our blind spot. Strangest of all, though, we actually can become blind by our sight. We can be blinded by the fact that we can see. Isn't it true that sometimes we only believe what we see? So we're actually blinded by the only the facts that we have. This seems 
to be what happened to the church of Laodicea. They were blinded by their presumed ability to see. They claimed to have sight, and yet after Jesus' heavenly eye exam, they're diagnosed with blindness. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, he said they were wretched, pitiful, poor, and blind. They said, we have it all. We have everything we need. Laodicea, remember, we learned this from before. The city of Laodicea was known for their eye salve. They were known for the medicine of their eye that were made at their universities there. And the city that was known for curing eyes was blind. Another symptom of leaving Jesus outside the church, friends, is that we will become spiritually impaired. If Jesus is not inside, if he's not with us, he's not in us, we cannot see things clearly. Now, I'll say this once again. Laodiceans will be the last ones to admit this, though. Laodiceans will be shocked to learn that they had this symptom. What? I'm blind? What are you talking about? In their minds, they can see perfectly fine. Yet a Christian suffering from the absence of Christ in their lives will not realize they're blind. A person who has never had the ability to see doesn't know what they're missing. They don't know what sight is. And friends, every one of us is born blind to sin. We don't, this is what's amazing. Some of us think that we were born with the ability to see and we're not. Not spiritually, right? And see, that's what it's talking about. In case that uh, some of you are trying to test this theory by looking around the room, I can can see, so I must not be laid to sin. You'd be missing the point of what Jesus was trying to bring across. This is not talking about physical blindness. Since this is a spiritual issue, he's talking about spiritual blindness. In fact, the Greek word means not that they were physically blind. It meant that they were unable to understand, incapable of comprehending. See, this is the church that had it all, right? And every church says we have it all. We believe it all. We have all the truth. And yet, what Jesus is saying about the church of Laodicea is that you may have a lot of doctrine, you may have a lot of scripture, but you don't have any understanding. They claim to recognize the truth of God when they can't. They believe, Laodiceans believe they understand spiritual things when they do not. As Paul puts it in this way, he says in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The enemy is blinding our hearts, friends, to keep us from seeing the beauty of the gospel. And understand this word here, the, to keep them from seeing, it's understanding. And, and we've looked at the gospel before. We've looked at it in the past, and the gospel is super simple. If you have Jesus, you have life. He died for you. If you accept his salvation, you have eternal life. That's the gospel. Praise the Lord. For us not to be able to understand it, you have to be blind. Amen? That's what it is. And the enemy is out there trying to blind us, keep us blinded. And how does he keep us blinded? By making us think we can see. By helping us to fool ourselves into thinking that we can see. Of course, if Jesus was in the room, if he was present here today, the truth of our condition would become evident. As we read in our scripture reading, in John chapter 9, 39, Jesus says, For judgment I came into this world, that those who are blind will be able to see. And those who can see will become blind. You see, Jesus has a way of stepping into a situation and turning everything upside down. We were just talking about this at home the other day. Jesus said the last will be first and the first will be last. The blind will see and those who see will be blind. When Jesus walks into the room, everything is turned up. Everything that you know is, is turned upside down, right? Nothing seems what it is. Basically, what Jesus was saying is that his presence would reveal the reality of our ability to recognize spiritual things. If Jesus was in the room, would we recognize him as Jesus? You see, this is, we think, we we always, when we ever look at the scriptures, the, the stories in the scripture, we always think we'd do a better job. Right? Well, if I was there in the garden, I wouldn't eat the fruit. <laughs> yeah, you would have. If I was there with the children of Israel at the foot of the Mount of Olives, I, or the Mount, of Mount Sinai, I wouldn't have bowed down to the golden calf. Yes, you would have. If I was there in Jesus' day, I would have recognized him. Are you sure? If Jesus was to show up today, right now, and walk into this church, would you recognize him? We'd like to think we would, because we think he'd come in with that white robe and the red sash, right? 
He'd stick out because he'd be still walking like he did back in those days. But what if he came in jeans and a t-shirt? And he had long hair? Maybe a little bit disheveled? What if he came in looking kind of average? The kind of person that comes in, sits in the back, you never even notice them? Would you recognize him? A lot of people saw Jesus, but not many people recognized him. So if Jesus was here, would we recognize him? His presence will show, it will reveal our spiritual sight. As a result, those who admitted being blind would receive sight. Those who knew, those who admitted that they didn't know the things of God were able to see Christ. But those who claimed to see, they never recognized Jesus. In fact, a few of the Pharisees who happened to be standing near Jesus when he made that statement made a typical Laodicean response. When Jesus made the mention that he was going to bring sight to those who were blind and blindness to those who were sighted, they said, well, we're not blind, are we? And the Greek, the way it's, the way it's worded, they're expecting a no answer. They, they, they weren't asking it because they were really curious. It was more of one of those statement questions. Well, we're not blind. Are we? No, you're not talking. You can't be talking about us. We're the teachers of the law. I mean, if anybody understands spiritual things, we do. We know the law. We know our scriptures. We know more than anyone else. And we could prove it. Just let's, let's hold a seminar. We could prove it. But tragically, very few of the Pharisees recognized and admitted their problem in this category. They all accepted and they thought that they could see when in fact they couldn't see the God standing right in front of them. They thought when they asked this question that Jesus would say, no, you're not blind, but Jesus' answer was not what they wanted. But it never was, was it? Again, we want the Hananiah message. When we say, God, that's not us, is it? And we want God to say, no, that's not you. No, I was talking about the, other, the people who aren't here today. <laughs> That's who this message is for. But Jesus doesn't say that. He says, no, I'm talking to you. Jesus' answer to them, are we blind? We're not blind also. He answers them in the very next verse, 41. If you were blind, you would have no guilt. That word, the King James is, uh, translates it correctly. You would have no sin. Now, notice this. If you were blind, if you really didn't know, then you wouldn't have sin. But because you claim that you can see, your sin remains. Because you think you have understanding, you remain in your sins. Why? Because you will never accept the gospel of God. It shouldn't have surprised them this answer, though. Because in many places, Jesus called them out on their spiritual blindness. Their inability to understand spiritual things. Just look at Matthew chapter 23. <laughs> we all know it's Matthew chapter 24. That's the famous chapter that talks about the, 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 the signs of the coming of Christ. But the, the chapter 23 is the woes to the Pharisees. And let me tell you, the whole chapter is full of it. Woe to you, you blind fools. That's what he would say. You blind hypocrites. Over and over and over, he called them out on their blindness. In fact, in Matthew 15, 14, Jesus told the disciples, leave them alone. When they were asking about what they were talking about, Jesus said, leave them alone. They're just the blind leading the blind. Have you ever thought about that blind leading the blind? I think I've told this illustration here before, but it really just drives it home. I, again, that, that same week when I was working at blind camp, one of my one of my campers that week was, was what they considered legally blind. He wasn't completely blind, but uh, had a little bit of vision. He could see shadows and shapes a little bit. And he saw well enough to be able to go down the path to the dining hall from our cabin. And after making the trip on several of the days, he finally brought a suggestion up to me. Since I had to make several trips guiding the other kids from my cabin over to the dining hall, he said, why don't you help, let me help you? And I'll, I'll take some with me. And normally what I did is I had one on each arm and I would take them down through the path. And so he decided he was going to do the same thing. And so my partially sighted camper grabbed two of the other campers and started to walk behind me. And we learned something that day. Just because he had just enough sight for him to see the path, he didn't have enough sight to help them down the path. 
Because at every, as, as soon as we left the cabin and got to where the path was, which went, led through the trees, I could hear behind me, swack, ow, flack, ow, flack, ow. He was running them into every obstacle possible. Afterwards, they said, Bill, don't let, them do, don't let them do that again. The blind leading the blind. You may think you can see because you're feeling your way throughout Christianity, but you can't see, friends. Even if you just think you're legally blind spiritually. No, you're completely blind. We need a guide that can take us there. That's Jesus. The Pharisees, they thought they could lead the other people, but they were blind leading the blind. If they would only accept their blindness, Jesus says, he could be helped. If they would only accept the fact that they really didn't understand things, then Jesus could help them. He says, if you were blind, then you would have no sin. I can help you. But sadly, they wouldn't. And you know, this is a symptom that's been persistent in man for a long time. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 29. Isaiah chapter 29, and we're going to start in verse 9. This is a very interesting passage. It almost sounds like God causing, causes people to be blind. And of course, we know in the Old Testament, God takes credit for everything, good and bad, right? So, so in here, it sounds like God is causing this, but understand this, it's because when we, we, we step outside of God, we walk away from God that these things happen. But notice what it says here, starting in verse 9, Isaiah 29, it says, Astonish yourselves and be astonished, or it or can mean uh, to, to linger a while, to stay, stick around a little bit and be astonished, that's what it means. Blind yourself and be blind. Be drunk, but not from wine. Stagger, but not, with, not with, from strong drink. For the Lord has poured out on you a spirit of deep sleep, has closed your eyes, which are the prophets, and covered your heads, which are the seers. Right away, he's saying, I'm making it so you can't see. Verse 11 says, The vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. And when men give it to one who can read, they say, read this. He says, I can't, for it's sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I can't read. God says, I'm going to put a condition in you. Marvel at this. Wonder at this. You're stubbornly be, continuing to be blind. You're staggering around like you're drunk, even though you haven't had a drink. He says, I've closed the books. I've made it so that you can't understand. All these visions, all these dreams, all these things that are coming... Remember the, the parables? Jesus spoke in parables. Why did he speak in parables? He said he spoke in parables because the, the Pharisees who didn't want to see, they weren't going to see it. He even quoted from Isaiah. But notice the very next verse. Look at verse 13, because 13 tells us why they don't understand. Verse 13, you've heard this passage before. It says, And the Lord said, Because this people draw near to me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and the fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, and wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. We draw away from God. We might praise Him with our lips, but our hearts are far from Him. He says, because of that, He's going to do a wonderful thing. And this is not a wonderful as good thing. This is a wonderful tragic thing. Because it says, your wisdom will die out. Your discernment will perish. This is that lukewarm symptom. Remember it? The lukewarmness is when we praise God from our lips. We, give all, we say all the right things. We wear the right clothes. We drive the right car. We do all the right things as a Christian should do. But our hearts are not with God. And this lukewarmness leads to blindness. When we fake our relationship with God, verse 13... Our wisdom and discernment die out. You see, friends, you can't fake it as a Christian and make it. People always, that's one of the phrases I hate it. Fake it till you make it. I don't know where that ever works. Now, practice makes perfect. That's, that, that one actually makes sense. But make it to, fake it till you make it? No. It doesn't work. You know, you know just pretend that you're a, a world-class athlete. Well, if you keep pretending you're a world-class world class athlete, you'll never make being a world-class ath athlete. That's a hard thing to say. <laughs> I'm going to choose something simpler. <laughs> but isn't it true? You Just fake being in shape. Until you're in shape. Yeah, right. If you can't make it up the stairs without huffing and puffing, you can't fake it. 
right? You might try to. It, no, I'm fine. <laughs> but you know that's not how it is. In Christianity, we can't fake it. When we fake it, we actually hurt it because we're pretending to have something that we don't, which means we'll lack all the things that come with the relationship with God. And one of those things is spiritual sight. This is why, regardless of the pleasant atmosphere and the appearance of our worship or our supposed knowledge of scriptures, if Jesus is not in us, we are spiritually blind. If Jesus is not in your life, if he's not a part of your life, where you go to for truth, if that's not where it is, Jesus Christ, then you are blind, friend. If you go to Google before the Bible. Oh, wait, let me step on a toe. If you go to Ellen White before you go to the Bible. If Jesus Christ is not your source of truth, friends, you're going to be blind. People weren't supposed to follow Jeremiah. They were supposed to follow the God of Jeremiah. The people weren't supposed to follow Moses. They were supposed to follow the God of Moses. Friends, you're not supposed to follow Ellen White. You're supposed to follow the God of Ellen White. Don't follow me. Follow my God. It's supposed to be your God, right? Jesus needs to be the source. He needs to be where you go to. He needs to be in you. Otherwise, you don't understand anything. It's the truth. Jesus gave an, or God gave us another warning, a grave warning in, in Isaiah chapter 6. Look at this one. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9. Starting in verse 9, we're going to also read verse 10. If you're there, say amen. You know, I've noticed last time I, last time I said that I didn't say anything about it, but I noticed that people say amen while they're still searching. <laughs> I think if someone says, just say amen, people go amen, and they don't even realize. Just, if you're there, say amen. Amen. Yeah, I'm not there yet. It's all right. We're all there now, right? Amen. Praise the Lord. Verse 9 says, And he said, Go and say to the people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. See, this is one of those passages that's that's kind of scary and hopeful as well. It's kind of all mixed in there. It's kind of contradictory because in, in some ways it's kind of like God is saying don't let them see lest they turn yet it's telling us that if we will see we can turn we will turn but yet what do we do we do the first part of the verse we're stubborn we keep being blind we keep we we keep seeing things but not understanding them and we keep hearing things but not not listening to them we we don't do what God asks us to do we don't follow This is what happens if we stubbornly continue to believe we can see. See, if we could see, we would turn to Jesus and be healed of everything else. If we could see, we would recognize Jesus as the answer to every question possible. As Jesus said to the Pharisees, if we were blind, if we accepted that we know nothing without God, then we can be given sight. But if we will continue to pretend to know it all, holding on to our own wisdom and traditions, then then our blindness is incurable. So you might be wondering, how can end time Laodiceans, how can we receive light, sight, if we're blind? Well, the answer is there back in Revelation 3. Revelation 3 and verse 18. 17 tells us the problem. 18 tells us the cure. The solution for our blindness is in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18 says this. I counsel you to buy gold from me, refined in the fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourselves, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve for your, to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. What God says here, what Jesus says here, is he counsels us to buy something else from him. Last time we knew, we heard, learned that he wanted us to buy pure gold. Gold that's tested in the fire, right? He wanted us to to accept that testing from him. And now he wants us to buy from him salve or medicine for our eyes that he can anoint us with. This time it's medicine. And it says he will apply it. 
In fact, it says he will anoint us with this medicine. Now, most of the time when you think of that word anoint with this thing, you're thinking of some eye drops, aren't you? Because when you anoint somebody, you anoint somebody with liquid, right? But that's not what this word means. This word means to smear on. I like that. And you're going to see why in a moment. Because this word anoint is the same word used in the story of the healing of the blind man in John chapter 9. So go to John chapter 9 real quick. You probably know this story. This is Jesus' eye salve. If you want to know what his eye salve is all about, this is his medicine. John chapter 9 starts off, here's the story of a man who is born blind. And, and Jesus and his disciples, they find this man, and the disciples ask that question most people want to know. Who's the one who sinned, this man or his parents? They want to know, why is he blind? Why was he born blind? There, obviously, there's some kind of a curse. And Jesus says, it's not because of that. It's so God's glory can be revealed. And then Jesus does one of the most unorthodox things, especially by today's medical standards. All right? This is, if, if the man was not blind, he may not have let Jesus continue. It says that Jesus spit into the ground and began to make mud with his spit in the dirt. And then after he had finished making this mud, it says he anointed the man's eyes. <laughs> uh, you, you, you're, you didn't get that, I don't think. I, I mean, I just, you just try to imagine. I can, I can already sense my wife cringing at the thought of somebody putting spit on another person. I mean, it's very unorthodox, isn't it? Jesus makes this mud, and he smears it in the man's eyes. And he says, I want you to go to wash it out in the pool of Siloam. And the man goes and does what Jesus has asked. And he comes back with sight. You, you can call it unorthodox. You can call it just plain Gross. But friends, that's an amazing miracle. Because this is not a man who got hit in the head and had a detached retina or just his vision started going bad. He started getting cataracts. He couldn't see as well. This is a man who was born blind, which means he was born with inability to see. Things didn't connect right up there. It didn't develop right. So he couldn't see from the very beginning. And yet, with some spit from the Creator, this spit mud put in his eyes, He's made whole. Now after the healing, the Pharisees get wind of this. In fact, the people who were surprised about this man, they took him to the Pharisees, I guess probably to prove that he was healed or what. I'm not sure exactly. It doesn't say why they brought him to the Pharisees. But the Pharisees saw this as a chance to be able to question the man. You see, the healing had occurred on Sabbath. And that was a big no-no. That was against the tradition and the laws of the elders. You see how good our traditions and laws are? They would have kept this man from receiving sight. So they they questioned this man and his parents, in fact, trying to get out from them who this man was who would defile the Sabbath and heal who this Sabbath-breaking so-called healer was. Which is interesting. They spend the whole rest of their Sabbath questioning this man and his parents. What a great way to spend the Sabbath. They're accusing Jesus of breaking the Sabbath for healing somebody, giving them sight, and they spend the rest of the Sabbath trying to question a man so they can find a ways to bring the healer down, to capture him. When they are not able to convince this formerly blind man that Jesus was not of God, the man himself claiming if he wasn't from God, he would be able to do nothing, they in their fury threw him out of the synagogue. And understand, this was not just removing him from the premises, That was removing him from membership. When the Pharisee threw him out, that was done deal. He was no longer allowed back in that synagogue. It would seem to this man he was just rejected by God. He stood up for this man Jesus, and he was rejected by the leaders, the spiritual leaders of the time. But here's where the story really gets good, friends. This is the most beautiful part of the story because what we're going to find out is that Jesus didn't come just to heal this man physically. He came to heal this man spiritually. I love what the story says next. Because right after the man gets kicked out, the Bible says that Jesus hears that he was kicked out and went to find him. Praise the Lord. (laughs) When he was rejected by man for standing up for God, Jesus personally went to encourage him. That's the kind of God we serve. Don't you love that? 
That's such an amazing thought to think that if I, st- Jesus, what he said, if you stand up for me before men, I will stand up for you. This man stood up for Jesus. He was saying, listen, he's got to be God because he healed me. He did what no man could do. I was born blind. Even, even modern medicine is not able to do that yet. And he did it. And they kicked him out for it. Banished him from church. Boy, I wonder how many modern day Christians are kicked out of church for following Jesus still. Jesus personally came to encourage him. The man himself did not go looking for Jesus, but how could he? He never saw Jesus. He had heard his voice, but when Jesus came and healed him, before he healed, he was blind. So he didn't know what Jesus looked like, did he? In fact, he was very honest when he answered the Pharisees when they said, who is he? He said, I don't know who he was. I didn't see him. I heard him. He told me to go do this. But he could have passed Jesus there on the side of the road and not known who he was. Jesus didn't want to let that happen, though. So he went looking for him. Jesus went looking. And it says when he found the man, he tested the effects of the heavenly LASIK that he had done earlier. (laughs) He gave him perfect eyesight by asking him a simple question. He says, do you believe in the Son of Man? Basically, he was asking, do you believe in the Messiah? Do you believe in the one who was sent by God? And the man's answer is beautiful. He says, I would if I knew who he was. I, but I don't know. I, I couldn't see. I've never seen him before. Point him out and I'd gladly believe. Uh, You've got to love the man's faith. You see, already there you can see that there's spiritual sight in his life because he desires to believe. He wants to believe in God. That's very different from the Pharisees, isn't it? When the people told the stories... To, Jesus, to, to the Pharisees about Jesus' healings, they didn't say, wow, we want to get to know him so we can believe. They said, it must be of the devil. They always tried to answer it away. This man, he says, I want to see him so I can believe. And I'm sure there was a smile growing on Jesus' face when he says, well, you have seen him. He's the one talking to you right now. Now, it's interesting. Normally, those kind of words as we've seen earlier in the passages of Scripture, would have resulted in people grabbing stones, ready to crucify, ready to to stone Jesus and kill him. The Pharisees did it many times when he said, I am he, or I am the one, or or, I am the one who is in the desert. When every time Jesus even kind of admitted that he was one with the Father, they wanted to stone him. And when Jesus says, I am the Messiah, I'm standing right here in front of you, the man says... I believe. That's spiritual sight, friends. Spiritual sight would recognize Jesus when he's standing right in front of you. Spiritual sight wants to believe in Jesus. We're looking for, we're searching for Jesus. That's what spiritual sight is. The most amazing thing is not that he just said, I believe. A lot of Christians do that today. But it says he fell down and he worshipped him. True spiritual sight in your life will result in worshiping Jesus Christ. No other things in your life would be worshipped. You see, the smearing of this mud in his eyes not only allowed the man to see Jesus, but it helped him to recognize him as Savior as well. And Jesus says, I want to anoint your eyes too. I want to smear on your eyes too. I want to give you sight, not just so you can see me, but so that you can recognize me. And you recognize everywhere. It's amazing to me. The Bible says that the heavens declare the glories of God. And yet there's a lot of scientists that look up there and they never see Jesus. They never see God. You look all around us. We were just looking at even just the ice that's hanging on. It's, it's weird. It's dangerous. But it looks pretty. Right? The, the grass looks nicer than it ever has. You know, it's got like this... Looks like glass grass. The rose bush out our, our, out of our, uh, outside our window has, has like little thorn. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't even know what it is, but there's off the leaves, there's just like these little pointy icicles. It's like it grew new thorns. It's, it's beautiful. We can see God's hand in all those things. If we have spiritual sight. You can see, this is the work of the Messiah. 
Jesus said when he came, one of the parts of his Messiah, him being Messiah, the, the work that Isaiah said they would do, the one he read in Luke 4, 18, was that he would come to proclaim sight for the blind. He would come to give sight to those who can't see. But the problem is, is that too many people will not admit that they can't see. We have to admit it if we're going to receive sight. We have to confess that we're blind. We have to own up to the fact that we can't understand anything in this without Jesus Christ. You know, in fact, I think it's a tragedy if we try to... to defend or describe any of our doctrines outside of, without Jesus. Everything that we believe only has meaning inside Jesus Christ. Everything. So how can Jesus give sight to those who think they already can see? So how's your sight today? Do you think you can see pretty clearly or are you blind? I'll tell you, friends, that as much as we want to admit that we can see, never in Scripture does it say that mankind can ever claim that. Every time in Scripture it says when you claim to think you can see, when you believe you can see, that's when you're blind. So in other words, it's not saying how good your vision. It's saying when are you going to admit it, that you're blind. Because every one of us is. None of us have understanding outside of God. So will you admit it today? Are you blind? Why would you want to stumble around trying to feel your way around in Christianity thinking you have sight when Jesus can give you true sight? When he can help you not just to see things, but to understand. A lot of people say, I can't understand the Bible. No, you can't because we're blind. But with Jesus, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can see. You can think, see things clearer than others. You won't panic the next time the news says something about whatever they're here and there. Because you know God's got you. Amen? That's why you didn't see me panic when they were talking about the four blood, blood moons. Friends, the, if we will admit it, God can actually give us sight. Then we're trusting in Him. We have no need to fear. But we need his medicine first. So will you come and accept the medicine from Jesus and let him give you sight? If that's your desire this morning, will you, will you raise your hand? Do you want God to give you that eye salve? Praise the Lord. Oh, Jesus, we, ask, we pray that he will open our eyes that we might see. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask that you will open our eyes. It is very easy for us to continue to fall into the trap that the Pharisees did because we have so much information. We live in the day of information. We have so much knowledge, it seems, on Scripture that we, we can actually become a little bit prideful in the fact that we already know it all. But, Father, help us not to rest on our knowledge, the trivial knowledge that we have, but help us to know that wisdom is knowing you. So, Father, we ask that as we come to you, you saw our hands right now, we want you to give us sight. We're admitting right now that we cannot understand, we cannot see. So, as we've come to you, smear that anointing on our eyes that we might see you, recognize you, and as the man did, fall at your feet and worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.